Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to another episode of Podcast with God on a Jin. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jim Vansty, and with me is my co-host, Gautam Sivaj. Today, we're excited to have Lloyd Trinish with us. Lloyd is an IBM Distinguished Engineer and Chief Scientist in IBM Research, specializing in weather and environmental topics. Lloyd, welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, some of your listeners may actually see a lot of our IBM created weather forecasts and weather information on their mobile devices, on uh, television, on uh, websites, and uh, many other uh, uh, sources of information. Wonderful. Now, how can the government and commercial sectors leverage open data sets from EU and U US government agencies, for example, to assess observed changes and attributing their causes, such as changes in climate, land use, et cetera. Yeah, so this is a very interesting problem that you that you bring up. There's government agencies for decades have created data sets uh, that uh, from uh, sensors on spacecraft and sensors on the ground and in the atmosphere are about weather conditions and that long-term monitoring can tell you about air quality and water quality or how our climate is changing. Uh, those data sets might be openly available, uh, particularly from a lot of government agencies, but they're not necessarily so easy to use. And they may not be in a form that's actionable, you know, so that uh, for a decision maker that's focused on a particular problem, let's say in agriculture or energy, that's where their expertise is. Their expertise is not going to be in the data, not going to be in the instrumentation, but in the you know the business process, the business use case. And so that becomes a challenge for governments uh, that or government agencies that have that specialty, or uh, you know or commercial uh, concerns that uh, may also work in those areas. Gotcha. Now, are there gaps in these data sets by content or ease of access for some stakeholders? Uh, oh, well, I think that's uh, that, that's an important uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so I uh, alluded a little bit to the kind of ease of uh, access, you know, so particular stakeholders, you know, their expertise is going to be in, let's say they're, they're farmers or their agribusinesses, their expertise is going to be in agronomy and, and how to improve crop yield, uh, et, et cetera. Um, and the, the data that may be openly available, you know, may not be in a form that they, they can easily, uh, you know, e easily consume. But then uh, the, those available data may, may also be um, insufficient. You know, so well, some of the things that we often see is that the systems that uh, the governments operate tend to be more generic. Uh, they may not have a lot of localized detail and so localized might be uh, uh, spatially, so let's say focused on, uh, let's say, a, a particular city or metropolitan area, let's say it's a renewable energy company, it may have insufficient detail, both spatially and temporally, to tell you the effectiveness of a, a solar farm or a wind farm, for example. So the, the um, and uh, so that lack of specificity for the business use cases is a typical uh, gap. And then ease of use is often another gap in these in these data sets. So where it requires some, you know, translation uh, or creation of uh, additional models or analytics that sort of connect the the measurements to the the open weather information would tell you about, oh, there's going to be storms and maybe something about the timing and the intensity. But what an electric utility would really need is to understand, well, what's the likelihood of power outages? And what resources do I need to restore the power uh, as quickly and as uh, safely and as efficiently as possible? So that's another gap where the open data tells you something that's driving an impact but what the stakeholder needs is to understand what that impact is and so that's where uh, there's opportunities for more research agree research is must and you brought up the crux of the conversation the need to be consistent while using the data for better and impactful outcomes 
My following question is about the role of data from new sources like spacecrafts hovering in lower Earth orbit or satellites that are being used for different services like vegetation management. What are your views on that? Yeah, well, so th this is, uh, I address some, definitely some uh, views on this uh, because it uh, was some bias because it somewhat relates to things I've been doing at, at IBM uh, uh, for, for for some time. So that traditionally, you know, the um, environmental data was provided by government uh, uh, agencies. Uh, you know, some like in the U.S. have made uh, such data openly available. You know, um, and that tends to be the trend. You know, along the lines of what we were discussing a few minutes ago. Some governments don't make. You know, they 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 do that, but they don't make the data. You know, openly available. Uh, but there there are gaps, uh, as as we were discussing. And some of those gaps have been recognized from a commercial you know, perspective, and then we've seen commercial investment al along those lines. So, um, so now, for example, there are uh, a number of private companies that have uh, launched their own fleet of spacecraft, particularly in low Earth orbit. And um, the, the, the largest set of them you know, tend to focus on uh, Earth observations of sort of the monitoring of uh, like the Earth's surface, so lots of uh, imagery, for example, and that uh, the, that imagery can be used for monitoring environmental and other conditions, uh, and uh, can be used uh, for uh, you know predictive models. Um, some of those companies also do that, while or while others may sell the data to other companies or even under contract to the government. And provide the data back to the government to to government agencies to fill in those gaps uh, that we talked about earlier from what um, is traditionally done just by ju just uh, just by governments. Um, so we're seeing that in a in a, in a few er uh, areas, not just of monitoring like with imagery. There are also companies that are doing this to look at the Earth's atmosphere to improve uh, the weather forecasts and th things of that sort. Uh, which um, and then. There are companies, including including IBM, where we we take advantage of data from public and private sources. In practice, uh, the governments, you know, may provide base data, but there are gaps as we've discussed. But they may not be sufficiently specific for particular uh, applications and business use cases. And so the private sector can step forward and fill those and address those gaps. May create new data with observations. But uh, but it's very much a partnership. One of the things that we've not seen a lot of yet is the uh, from the from the uh, private sector uh, has been on the longer term um, data acquisition. Uh, you know, so the kinds of things, the kind of data that the governments have been active in, where you would let's say you're trying to monitor a lo monitor long term land use changes, how the climate is changing. Because those sorts of observations require decades. So viability of doing that commercially has only been, especially from orbit, it's only been in the last, uh, you know, last several several years. Um, on the other hand, uh, one of the things that we are seeing is sort of extension of uh, the analytical services, where, you know, which of where we have a, a, a mature market around uh, weather impacts. Now thinking about longer term, you know, impacts uh, related to climate change, and then trying to provide uh, assistance for for customers doing more strategic planning uh, around either their resilience against the impacts of climate change or trying to mitigate the impacts of climate change by reducing uh, greenhouse gas footprints or the combinations, you know, thereof. Is there any need for research by public or private entities? to evaluate effectiveness of energy trade-offs and increase sustainability and be more resilient to hazards induced by changing climate. Today, we are seeing flash flooding, evacuations, and power outages making headlines at Weather Channel and not just cities, but villages getting struck with tornadoes, monarch butterflies getting classified as endangered. Tell our listeners something what we are seeing, is it just weather or is it really the climate change? How should we really differentiate? Is there a way to clearly identify planetary warming? 
Yeah, so this is this is a uh, a complex uh, problem, and I and I would say we're just beginning to to see that. Uh, you know, there's this tendency uh, to uh, look at uh, this these sorts of problems in silos. You know, so for example, you know, there are you know we see you know governments and private companies uh, uh, talking about their sustainable practices. And you know, often you know that might be looking at uh, their uh, greenhouse gas footprint, or you know, or actually kind of a, a subset of that. Only thinking about uh, you know, uh, let's say just carbon dioxide, and um, and 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 uh, and from a simple accounting you know uh, perspective. Well, that's an important way to start. It does not really reflect on. Um, you know, the contributions, the actual contributions to the carbon or greenhouse gas inventory in the atmosphere, you know, over the long term, because that's what contributes to uh, uh, really to, to planetary warming. So you know, there's, um, and in some cases, if it's just uh, carbon offsets, that actually sort of, uh, uh, you know, kind of kicks the can down the road because it's not really affecting the, the uh, reduction of inventory of uh, greenhouse gas for you know, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but kind of pushes that down to some to a later period of time. So, you know, that's, you know, that that's one element that we see. And then we often see then in sometimes in the same entities, public or private or independently, we'll see organizations talk about being resilient against the impacts of climate change. So that might be you know their infrastructure being more more robust okay uh, so in a city you know that might be well you know if let's say it's a coastal city you know how effective are their um, defenses if any you know similarly on the private side you might see an electric utility investing in in uh, in renewable energy but then uh, you know the independently of that you know they would uh, another part of that same company might only be looking at uh, the reliability of their uh, electric infrastructure with regard to storms, but you know how do those things connect together and the feedbacks at at, a at at both the local scale, but over different time ranges. And so this this is these are uh, a lot of complex you know interactions that we want to uh, that we think there's opportunity to um, to. Uh, 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 do analysis of data and developing more customized models to improve how one can uh, uh, plan for changing changing climate to be ready for the effects that we're seeing already and to help uh, become more sustainable in the future. Yes, and thank you for sharing your thoughts on need for impactful research on weather, data, and climate change. Today with us, we had the distinguished environmentalist Lloyd Trinish, please feel free to reach out to discuss more on sustainability or resiliency with him. And I'm thinking around the lines from Disney now, uh, a Disney show, Aladdin. More often than not, it's hotter than hot. Well, thank you all listeners for your constant sharing and support. It means a lot. We'll be back. You were listening to What's Up With Technology with Gautam Sivaj and Jin Steve.